powerful engines and the spray of foam. Speeding to battle to meet the challenges faced by the United States Navy in the muddy brown waters of the Mekong River Delta. The PBR, or Patrol Boat River, became the backbone of U.S. naval forces on Vietnam's inland waterways. Small, fast, and deadly, the PBR was one of the most versatile fighting packages that ever took to the water. Its 30-foot long, 10-foot wide fiberglass hull mounted a powerful variety of machine guns and grenade launchers. They could travel up to 180 miles on a single tank of fuel. And with its twin engines driving a unique water jet propulsion system, the PVR could streak over the water at speeds of nearly 30 knots. Like the PT boat of an earlier era, the PVR earned the love of its crews and the respect of its enemies by demonstrating a relentless utility. Day in and day out, it performed every mission imaginable from search and seizure of enemy supplies to special warfare missions to supporting complex operations by other U.S. mobile riverine forces. It was qualities like these that earned the Patrol Boat River its hard-won nickname. To the crews who manned it, the initials PBR stood for proud, brave, reliable, One of the most important missions undertaken by the U.S. military in Vietnam was stemming the tide of enemy arms and supplies that flowed into the country. At the beginning of America's direct involvement in the conflict during the mid-1960s, the main concern of the U.S. High Command was infiltration in the coastal areas of South Vietnam. The president had already committed himself to assist the people of South Vietnam, so he sent General Westmoreland out there as the uh, ground commander, and he discovered that most of the infiltration was coming from the sea. And he turned to the Navy, and the Navy came up with this Operation Market Time, which was a coastal surveillance force. Beginning in 1965 with two Navy destroyers, Operation Market Time used a wide variety of vessels and aircraft. But Market Time's greatest success was centered around 17 Coast Guard cutters and 100 aluminum-hulled swift boats that patrolled the coastal waters and river mouths, stopped and searched thousands of suspect vessels, and effectively strangled the flow of arms into the country by sea. But somehow, munitions were still getting into South Vietnam. The market time had done such a good job on slowing down infiltration from the sea that Westmoreland said it must be coming in somewhere else. They ascertained from intelligence that it was coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail into Cambodia and then into Vietnam through the Delta. So naturally he turned to the Navy and said, do something about the Delta. Spreading over 75,000 square miles, crisscrossed by hundreds of tributaries and canals, the fertile Mekong River Delta south of Saigon was the heart of South Vietnam's food production, as well as a major population center. Because of its central role in the life and economy of South Vietnam, control of the Delta was vital for both sides during the war. The strategic importance of the Mekong Delta arose uh, from the fact that it was and still is the rice bowl of uh, South Vietnam. And the people in the Delta produced rice and other crops. So from a point of view of living in Vietnam, that Mekong Delta was terribly important. But in addition, the Mekong itself is a trade route. It's actually about 2,700 miles long. It goes up into Cambodia and to several other countries. Roads in the Delta were few making land-based military operations nearly impossible. Everything and everyone traveled by water, with traffic ranging from family-owned sampans to large commercial shipping and barges. Faced with a totally new combat environment, the Navy was forced to devise new tactics 
and to adapt its hardware to the demands of the shallow waters of the Mekong. But the existing patrol boats were encumbered by size, deep draft hulls, and especially their propellers and rudders, which were vulnerable to damage in shallow waters. The Navy's existing fleet was clearly not suited to navigate the knee-deep canals and twisting channels in which they were expected to operate. To meet this need, the U.S. Navy distributed specifications to contractors in 1964, inviting them to submit plans for review. Because they needed the boats quickly, the Navy took the nearly unprecedented step of soliciting proposals from pleasure boat manufacturers, knowing that they would already have a level of expertise manufacturing small, fast boats that was lacking in the larger shipbuilding companies the Navy usually dealt with. Into this picture stepped a man named Willis Slane. Slane was a former hosiery manufacturer who had decided to build yachts out of fiberglass in an era when most people thought the material was only good for bathtubs. Undaunted by the fact that he had never worked in the defense field before, the hard-charging Slane decided to go after the Navy contract. Willis Slane and his naval architect, Jack Hargrave, uh, went to a meeting in D.C. prepared to pitch their new 50-foot fiberglass hull as a contender in this competition. But while they were at the meeting, uh, it soon became apparent to them that the Navy wasn't looking for a 50-foot boat. They'd already found a 50-foot boat, an aluminum hull boat, uh, built by a Louisiana firm. But the Navy still needed a smaller boat to patrol the Mekong Delta. Slane didn't miss a beat. He stood up in the middle of the meeting and said, Captain, I've got a 28-foot hull. What we could do is we could put water jets on this thing, put guns on it, and have a boat that could operate in the shallow water environment of the Mekong Delta without becoming entangled in the swamps. It would be perfect for the role. And I'll build it at my own cost. When asked by the Navy to produce plans for such a boat, Slane said, I haven't got time for that paperwork stuff. I'll build the damn thing, and then you can come down next week and ride in it. True to his word, the prototype was built and ready for testing in seven days. When the Navy came down a couple days later, they found a revolutionary craft in the water in Moorhead City, North Carolina. This was a 28-foot boat, water jet propelled. It could do 33 knots, three knots faster than the original Navy specification. The prototype's speed was only one of its impressive features. Unlike a normal vessel's rudder and propellers, the PBR's directional water jet pumps did not project below the line of its hull. As a result of this ingenious innovation and the design and weight of the light yet durable fiberglass hull, a fully loaded PBR showed a phenomenal improvement over similar craft considered for shallow riverine duty by extending as little as nine inches below the water. The water jets also had another advantage. They gave the boat unprecedented maneuverability. Steered by cables that rotated the water jet's nozzles right or left, the PBR prototype could outturn any boat in the Navy's fleet. In addition, to put the boat in reverse, a simple U-gate slipped over the nozzle, sending the flow of water back 180 degrees. It could stop from full speed within three lengths of its own hull, and it could do a 180 degree turn within the length of its own hull at top speed. The Navy just thought it was great. Almost immediately, the Navy purchased Slane's prototype for additional testing and evaluation. Tragically, Willis Slane would not see his boat reach production. Barely a week later, at the age of 44, he died of a heart attack. But Slane's dream of creating a new river patrol boat for the United States Navy had been fulfilled. And less than a year later, it would receive its first test in combat. Introduced into the Mekong Delta in March 1966, the first PBRs, called Mark Ones, quickly became the most heavily used Navy boats on the river. They were part of an operation called Game Warden, 
A continuing effort by the U.S. Navy to cut off the flow of supplies transported by the Viet Cong on the waterways of South Vietnam. Internally, these first PBRs were similar to Willis Lane's prototype, but externally, several improvements and additions had been made by the Navy and the boat's prime contractor, United Boat Building of Bellingham, Washington. Most noticeable was the formidable array of guns that now armed the PBR. The first PBR Mark I had a twin 50 caliber mount forward. It had a single mount M60 machine gun, which used 7.62 NATO ammunition. And amidships, we had a, a configuration where we could put a machine gun or a Mark 18 grenade launcher. Light ceramic armor, capable of stopping bullets of up to 30 caliber, surrounded the helmsman and weapon stations, giving the crew some protection. Another important part of the PBR's new equipment was the electronics package. We had a Raytheon 1600 radar, which was a radar that fishermen used, and it was a very effective at short range, if it's all you needed for in the Delta. And then we used two UHF radios. The radar, mounted in a prominent plastic dome above the steering station, was sensitive enough to detect even small irregularities in the water's surface. This was crucial at night if a high-speed run became necessary. Two separate radios permitted simultaneous air, river, ground communications in combat situations. Yet as sophisticated as these little boats had become, the heart of a PBR was its most basic component, its four-man crew. Most of these sailors grew to love their boats, and they knew them from stem to stern. They were attracted to PBRs by the lure of action and the quick opportunities for command they gave young petty officers, who would have had to wait for years for the same chance on a larger craft. The choice of petty officers wasn't limited to those with boat handling experience. They could be of many different types or ratings. It was all a volunteer force, and we needed, for the boat crew, we needed a first-class petty officer as the boat captain. So it didn't make any difference what kind of petty officer he was. He could be an aviation rate, an engineering rate, or a boats and mate. We just wanted him to be a strong, first-class petty officer. The remaining crew contained an engineman, a gunner's mate, and a seaman. But during combat, everyone except the captain driving the boat handled a gun and the thorough cross-training the crew received guaranteed that the loss of any one member would not disable the boat in combat. You had to be really tight and know exactly what the boat would do and how to handle each item on the boat. The teamwork that you, you got involved with and the bonding between yourself and the boat and the other members of the crew was just unbelievable. I'd come off an aircraft carrier with 5,000 guys on it. I thought I was part of the crew. When I went onto this boat, I knew I was part of a team. The crews quickly developed a unique esprit de corps, a maverick attitude similar to that of the spirited young sailors who manned the PT boats in World War II. It was a quality symbolized by the black berets worn by the PBR crewmen as part of the uniform. On patrol, the PBRs were used in groups of two. This ensured that one boat would always be available to cover the other during search procedures. My cover boat was always there to pull me out of trouble. I knew they knew their job, that they were one with their boat also. I had never had a moment where I worried where my cover boat was and what it was doing. I always knew that that team was back there backing us up 100%. Checking the endless river traffic for illegal cargo, Crewmen on patrol duty found life aboard a PBR alternated between hours of endless tedium and brief moments of shattering violence. They spent their time stopping hundreds of sampans and junks, boarding them and inspecting their papers and cargo. This process was repeated again and again, up to 100,000 times a month throughout the Delta. Sailors quickly learned to watch for the least suspicious action. There was no telling how a man, woman, or even a child would react if cornered with contraband on board. Some of the instincts you developed searching sandpans, you learned to look into people's eyes and, and you would see 
them turn nervous. They would start looking away. Or they wouldn't look straight at you. They'd be twitchy or they'd try to hide something. You, you looked at people more than the boat itself. The physical inspection of the sandpans added to the stress on everyone involved. It was very difficult to get through the sandpans. Some of them were only 12, 13 foot long. And when you put a, a six foot tall sailor at 180 pounds into a small sandpan, sometimes all the people got nervous looking because of the excessive weight and what it was doing to the sandpan, tossing it around a little bit. The larger boats that didn't happen on, but you had to be very careful searching sandpans. It's a very dangerous job. The war in South Vietnam was seldom a matter of uniforms and battle lines. The Viet Cong could be anywhere, often impossible to separate from the friendly South Vietnamese. Everybody has to have identity papers. It's like a U.S. passport. It has their picture signed by a province chief or a government official. But you couldn't tell by looking at somebody if they were the enemy or not. I mean, even if you looked at their papers, you still couldn't tell. You searched their boat to see if they had any counterband or ammunition. If it was a hit or miss. You didn't know whether they were going to be the enemy, going to shoot you in a minute or not. Air support was available, but a helicopter only had enough fuel to stay on station overhead for a maximum of one and a half hours, while the typical PBR mission was 12 hours long. But although over 250 men were killed and more than 1,500 wounded during Operation Game Warden, the choppers still helped lower casualties in the PBR significantly by attacking enemy strong points from the air. I was there 15 months, and during the 15 months, I hate to say this, I lost 21 helicopters. That's not too good. But those helicopters saved an awful lot of lives in the boats. If it wasn't for the helicopters, we'd have lost probably three times in crew. After a long day of inspections, the pairs of boats would return to World War II vintage tank landing ships called LSTs. They were brought out of storage to serve as floating home bases for the PBRs. Later in the war, shore bases were cut out of the jungle to replace the LSTs. You gotta remember, you don't have any uh, mess hall that you would have back in the States. And you don't have hot and cold showers, so uh, you're practically living off the land on some of these bases. During the course of these early operations, the crews learned to appreciate the impressive combat performance of the Mark Ones. But they saw that improvements could still be made. The commanders listened to their suggestions. The result was the second generation of river patrol boats, contracted in March of 1967 the now classic Mark II's. After we used the Mark I for about a year, we discovered that the gunnels were getting beat up, which are fiberglass, and so we wanted a, the new boat to have aluminum gunnels, which they did. The twin 50 caliber machine gun forward gave us a little bit of trouble electric-wise, and there was too much armor around it because the poor gunner couldn't see. So it said restrict the armor, increase the electricity so it, it's a better firing gun. And add a 50 caliber aft because we found out the 50 caliber really is great at busting up bunkers, which the VC would hide behind. The uh, pumps were giving us a little trouble with corrosion, so we had them change the metal content, of, and that made that pump better. One of the greatest threats to the PBRs were enemy rockets called B-40s. Many Mark Ones were sunk by B-40s in locations too dangerous for salvage operations. This problem was also addressed in the new Mark IIs. One of the most important things we added was flotation gear. And we found out that they could make blocks of flotation gear and put them in the Mark IIs, and you could put about three B-40 holes in it and they'd still float. And we asked them if they could fit the Mark I the same way, and they sent us blocks of this flotation gear, and we were able to help the Mark I the same way. 
By late 1968, there were over 250 PBRs in Vietnam. Most were Mark IIs that were being used in the Mekong Delta as part of Operation Game Warden. But while the PBRs and their crews were working extremely well, the tactics they used were not. Somehow, the Viet Cong were still getting the supplies they needed to carry on the war. If the PBR was going to be a truly effective part of the naval war effort, it would need help in achieving its goal. Responding to the need for a more effective strategy in the Mekong Delta, the Navy developed a cadre of new watercraft to reinforce the PBRs. Together with the PBRs, these new boats made up what was called the Mobile Riverine Force. The crews who manned the force had another name for it. They dubbed it the Brown Water Navy. When the new boats first came into use in early 1967, the Navy chose not to integrate them with the PBRs. The heavier units of the Mobile Riverine Force operated separately to drive the enemy from parts of the Delta, while the PBRs continued their work stemming the flow of arms to the Viet Cong. The so-called monitors were the spearhead of the new group. Converted from standard issue amphibious landing craft, they sat low in the water, leaving their various enclosed gun mounts as the primary feature of an ominous silhouette. The mix of weapons carried by the monitors varied, but the most powerful punch was usually provided by a 40 millimeter cannon in a front mount. A few late versions of the monitor included a flamethrower, used to destroy earthen bunkers dug into the riverbanks, which normal machine gun fire could not penetrate. But an even more effective weapon proved to be a water cannon, which flooded bunkers and subterranean passages to a point where they were no longer inhabitable. In addition to the heavily armed monitors, other converted landing craft were employed as command boats. Joining these vessels were armored troop carriers, which transported U.S. Army soldiers of the 9th Infantry Division, assigned to provide the Mobile Riverine Force with a ground fighting capability. The Navy planned to send this formidable array to strike areas where Viet Cong strongholds were thought to exist. And in July of 1967, the new heavy units of the U.S. Mobile Riverine Force received their first assignments, a series of three-day missions against the Viet Cong Battalion operating in the Delta. Trouble struck almost immediately. As the first troop carriers pulled to shore to land their men, they were met by a devastating barrage of enemy fire. Seven sailors and four soldiers were quickly wounded. And before long, a Viet Cong rocket slammed into the conning tower of a heavily armed monitor, killing its captain. As battles ebbed and flowed over several days, the operations commanders realized that they needed additional help. The call went out for the PBRs, and they joined the operation, helping to seal off the area with 50 caliber machine gun fire and preventing enemy movement along or across the local waterways. With their mobility, flexibility, and heavy firepower, the PBRs helped to turn the tide, making the battle a hard-fought success. This first combat test for the combined mobile riverine force clearly underlined several difficulties with the new heavy units. There were problems uh, with the heavies, partly because of their uh, weight and their lack of uh, ready maneuverability, but the, we had to work them into the operations and they fitted in very well in certain times and places. One of those times was in 1968 during the enemy's countrywide Tet Offensive. It was during Tet that the heavy mobile riverine force proved its worth when it, along with the PBRs, made significant contributions, even helping to save some of the largest cities in the Delta from enemy capture. Combined with the normal grind of patrol duty, the heavy combat the PBRs were being exposed to added significantly to the wear and tear on the boats. It fell to a dedicated group of maintenance men to keep the PBRs in fighting trim. 
I was a maintenance officer in Vietnam in the Mekong Delta, and my job was to patch up these boats when they came back. And the neat thing about doing this job was uh, we were given carte blanche by uh, the folks in Saigon to do whatever we could to get the max out of the boats. The boats were built for speed, but we tried to get as much speed as we could out of them over and above what they were designed to. It was tough because we worked around the clock because the boats had to be ready the next day to go on patrol. While the heavy mobile riverine force used the versatile PBRs only occasionally, they were still the most important U.S. boats in the Mekong Delta. PBRs could quickly move to strategic locations and dash rapidly in and out of areas of dangerous enemy contact. They also undertook specialized jobs like the insertion and extraction of Navy SEAL commando teams. These missions demanded the utmost skill and bravery on the part of everyone involved. The SEALs would move inland to attack their objective, which could be any one of dozens of potential targets, from an enemy supply depot to a command center. Once their mission was complete, the PBR would dash in and pick them up, often under a barrage of covering fire and speed away. Some of the most important and dramatic missions performed by the PBRs were in non-combat situations. I think the most striking moment or striking time that I was in Vietnam was we were coming off of a night patrol and we had done our 12 hours on station and we received a radio call and they turned our two patrol boats around to go back down the river to a town called Treon. And when we arrived at Treon, two young girls had walked into a marketplace crowded with people at five in the morning and it destroyed themselves. They had bombs hooked onto themselves and had taken out about 150 normal civilians who were just trying to, you know, go to the market and get some food for breakfast. We evacuated most of the people on those four boats. I think that was one of the things that sticks in my mind today. Amid the horrors of war, it was actions like this that helped demonstrate the remarkable versatility of the PBRs and their crews. Yet despite their many contributions, the PBRs would play an even greater role in the expanded tactics soon to be proposed by an innovative commander named Vice Admiral Elmo R. Zumwalt, Jr. It was an operational strategy called Sea Lords. The greatest moments of the PBR were yet to come. In October of 1968, Vice Admiral Elmo Zumwalt arrived in South Vietnam to take control of all U.S. naval forces. There stood General Abrams, Ambassador Bunker, Admiral McCain, and Admiral Zumwalt, and Admiral Veth. And I thought, well, <laughs> this is the big boys. <laughs> but he let me run my show the way I wanted to. Some of his staff used to get on me and I'd say, you tell your boss if he didn't like it, have him call me. And Admiral Zumwalt never called me on anything I did. Zumwalt was widely seen as an innovator and often tagged proposals to staff members with the letters ZWI for Zumwalt's wild idea. People might have criticized that, but I didn't. It made people think. He would come out with some wild ideas and say, what the hell, I got some wild ideas too and you'd throw them right back at him. And he was the type that would take him on board. He said, I don't give a damn where an idea comes from, is any good, use it. That was his theory. Zumwalt saw the Brownwater Navy's varied composition and lack of hardline doctrine as a strength. He told his senior commanders, you have to make up riverine warfare as you go along, keep changing the game plan. You can get away with almost anything once or even twice, but you must change strategies frequently in order to keep the enemy from exploiting you. Over the previous two and a half years, that was exactly what the enemy had done. 
noting that heavily loaded sampans were the most likely to be searched. The Viet Cong had switched tactics, placing small shipments of arms in otherwise empty sampans so they would ride high in the water, thereby becoming unlikely targets for the American PBRs. They also shifted their infiltration routes to avoid the most heavily patrolled areas. Partly to counter these new tactics, Zumwalt proposed a more aggressive strategy, which he called Sea Lords. In November of 1968, Zumwalt officially executed his plan. One of his primary goals was to establish a naval barrier to the flow of enemy arms and supplies right at the Cambodian border. In pursuit of this objective, Zumwalt sent larger patrol craft that were formerly used only in coastal areas into the same confined tributaries as the PBRs. The PBRs, in turn, were moved into even smaller rivers and canals that had previously been beyond the scope of their operations. I think the biggest thing was when they took us off the rivers and put us into the canals. That was the shock. And they said that you'll operate on nothing but rivers, big rivers, wide, you have maneuverability. And the first time to go into the Vente Canal, and all I could think was, oh my God, you could only go straight like an arrow. You know, you went one way or the other way, but there was no way, you know, to pull away from the bank and head out the deep waters. There was no deep waters. The resourcefulness of the PBR crews in carrying out Zumwalt's strategy helped make Sea Lords a resounding success. In fact, General Creighton Abrams, the commander of American forces in Vietnam, credited Sea Lords with declining Viet Cong activity in the Mekong Delta and a lower number of U.S. casualties overall. Among the PBRs and their crews, however, casualties were up as contact with the enemy increased. But more combat wasn't the only challenge faced by the PBRs. As Zumwalt's strategy progressed, Naval planners realized that the Viet Cong were changing their supply routes to avoid the U.S. naval blockade at the Cambodian border. Instead of coming directly down the Mekong, the flow of supplies now entered west of Saigon, through a region of Cambodia jutting into Vietnam called the Parrot's Beak. If you look at a map, there's two rivers that parallel that beak, is the Vam Co Te and the Vam Co Tom, and it aims right for Saigon. Well, you recall the 68 Tet they discovered all the BC were right around Saigon. And how did they get there with all the ammunition? Well, so somebody said, well, maybe that's where it came down that river. To combat this shift in the enemy's methods, Price, then a captain in the U.S. Navy, created a flexible river assault division in late 1968 with 30 PBRs at its core. And so this operation on the Parrot's Beak was going to be called Operation Giant Slingshot. I needed extra boats, so I asked Admiral Zomal to give me some PCFs, which were patrol craft fast, the swift boats, in the Markadam operation. So I got those boats, plus I got 40 PBRs from the Mobile Riverine Force. That gave me 100 boats. So with that, I used two helicopter fire teams. So that gave me four helicopters, 100 boats, two SEAL platoons, and on the 6th of December, 68, we started off. Well, we got into more firefights in the first day, so we knew that the VC were along that river, but we didn't know what they were doing. In an effort to gain the upper hand, the PBR crews devised a tactic they called waterborne guard post. While passing through an area traveled heavily by the enemy, one boat would cut its engines and quietly drift ashore as the second PBR gradually increased its speed. The effect heard in the distance sounded like two PBRs leaving the area. The remaining boat then waited to attack any unsuspecting Viet Cong who were deceived by the ploy. Price also used army troops to complement the riverine units under his command. After about a week and a half, we called in the U.S. Army, who had a battalion up there to sweep some of the banks. And lo and behold, they found 50-gallon drums buried along the banks full of ammunition. The first month, we must have got 100 tons of ammunition out of those rivers. 
And that's what they would have used for their Tet of 69, if there had been one. I'm convinced. Eventually, the commanders of Sea Lords decided to expand their area of operations even further. And the PBRs, with their light, sturdy fiberglass hulls with a spearhead of this new effort. The bridge had been destroyed north of Saigon into one of the main rivers. And so they wanted to search the, the river beyond the bridge. Well, how are you going to get boats beyond the bridge if you can't get under the bridge? Try a helicopter. So they flew it down to Bentui and we hooked it onto the PBR to see if it could lift it. My God, it did. It pulled it right up in the air. A lot of stuff fell out of the boat, but uh, we knew it was practical. So my answer was, yeah, we can airlift these boats into that river above the bridge if you can provide them logistic support. In June 1969, choppers carried six PBRs and their crews beyond the wrecked bridge. of a surprised enemy. 30 days later, the PBRs were again airlifted out, ready to fight another day on another river. Thanks in part to the innovative leadership of officers like Captain Price and Admiral Zumwalt, the PBR and its new tactics were now an unqualified success. But the war was about to change again. Small and light, the PBRs with their fiberglass hulls were almost flimsy in appearance. But time and again, they had proven themselves to be anything but soft. They took surprising amounts of damage, and with the ingenuity of resourceful maintenance crews, survived to fight again. We looked on it as a challenge, and uh, typically we'd get a boat back in pieces. And it would be our job to put the boat back together again. And sometimes we'd get half a boat. Sometimes we, we, we would get a quarter of a boat. Sometimes we would just get uh, baby engines. And the guys that worked for me were just magnificent. Uh, one time a boat came back. It had taken a B-40 rocket hit right here in the port side. And the rocket went through the port side and exploded in the engine. And this is what is left of the engine. This is a connecting rod pin. So the guys are so proud of themselves that they were able to rebuild. They got this for me and gave it to me and presented it to me. It's basically my only Vietnam memento, but, it, but it, it, for me, it has great value. Uh, it's, it's more than a paperweight to me. It represents a whole tour of duty there. PBRs routinely undertook the most daring and difficult missions possible on Vietnam's inland waterways. It was no wonder that the crews came to love their river warriors. The bond was equally intense between the sailors themselves. When you get onto one of these little things and you're out there and you know somebody's trying to kill you and you're locked up with just four guys on a little 30-foot boat, you become very good friends for a long time. I knew things about those guys that I would never tell to anybody. They know things about me that they will never tell to anybody. So it's a bonding I'll never forget. I'm, I'm glad the Navy sent me there. It's just something I, I, I treasure every minute of it. Working in close quarters, under almost constant combat alert, depending on each other for quick action, hearing the ricochet of bullets glancing off the ceramic armor as the boats roared through a hail of enemy fire, all served to create a strong link between the sailors and their craft. They didn't want to leave the river. They would end up with the two or three firefights a day after about four days. I'd say, that's enough. Come on back and reconnoiter. And their CEO would come up to me and say, why did you pull me off? And I say, you need some rest, fella. We need you for the fight next week, not tomorrow. It was with mixed emotions then that the men of the Navy PBR crews learned that every last one of their boats would be turned over to the South Vietnamese Navy. It was part of a program called Vietnamization, a countrywide effort initiated by President Nixon to shift responsibility for fighting the war to the South Vietnamese armed forces and the U.S. Navy was one of the first branches of the service to implement it. Giving up your boat, you had mixed feelings. 
And I think the feelings is that you were so much part of the boat, and the boat was so much part of you, it was like giving up a child or something and, and giving it over to somebody else to raise and take care of. The first PBRs were transferred to South Vietnam in 1969. By 1971, the total number of U.S. Navy PBR sailors in Vietnam was less than a third of its peak level two years before. We, we kept our patrols on the river and we added one Vietnamese to each boat until he was trained. Once he was trained, we pulled the sailor off, usually the seaman. And then we tr put another Vietnamese on and uh, usually that was the gunner. And then we pulled the sailor off, sent him back to the States. Then we trained the engineer and then we trained the boat captain. Once we got a four-man Vietnamese crew, then I turned the whole division over to the Vietnamese Navy and said, now you're in charge of this section of the river. When the last able-bodied American seaman left his boat in 1972, 293 PBRs were in the hands of the South Vietnamese Navy, three times as many boats as any other American-made watercraft. The PBRs continued to serve their new owners with the same rugged utility they had demonstrated from the beginning of their tenure in Vietnam. And even though their ultimate mission of helping to achieve victory was frustrated, the service these exceptional boats rendered was invaluable, indeed providing the cornerstone of American and South Vietnamese naval strategy in a unique and challenging environment. In succeeding decades, the PBRs continued to play a significant, though smaller, role in the U.S. Navy. And modern versions of the boats were still on active duty in the 1990s, nearly a generation after Willis Slane's revolutionary prototype first took to the water. Simple and transportable, flexible and fast, the patrol boat river has won a singular place in the history of naval combat. Perhaps not since the PT boats of World War II has another small vessel in the U.S. Navy taken on so many roles so successfully. But without a doubt, the most important legacy of the PBRs can be found in the officers and sailors who manned and commanded them. The PBRs uh, were near and dear to my heart because they were so effective when I was in command there. But it was very difficult for me, as it is for every military commander, to send men into action knowing that not all of them would come back. Here we have a monument listing the names of game warden people associated with PBRs they were killed in action in Vietnam. These names trigger emotional responses for those of us in that operation. The men in the PBRs were attached to one another. And when I see this list, it uh, brings tears to my soul, if not to my eyes. If I had to do all over again, I would be right back there again because the boats I really love. They were a part of me and they still are a part of me. To these gallant men, the words proud, brave, reliable will remain in their memory forever. <laughs>